Shall we start? Okay. Okay. So th thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give this non-gravitational wave talk. Uh, it's meant to be a fun talk. It's meant to generate uh, sort of discussion and interaction. So please uh, contribute. Please ask questions uh, anytime during the talk. Okay. Yes, that's one of the things. Okay. So one of the hardest things to do when giving a talk about M.C. Escher and the connection of his artwork to mathematics is to choose what topic to talk about. I mean, Escher did work <coughs> related to projective geometry, uh, to uh, topology, uh, including ambiguous perspective and impossible objects. Okay, Given that I have what uh, an, an hour today, I'm just going to focus on one, uh, which will be symmetry in the context of periodic tilings. Okay. Okay. So the plan will be: I'll give uh, uh, give you a brief biography of Escher. Okay, and uh, explain a connection to Roger Penrose, which some of you might not be aware of, that I think you'd be interested in. Uh, then I'll spend about 20 minutes talking about symmetry uh, transformations in the context of periodic tilings of the plane, and then spend the uh, the final half hour. <coughs> talking about periodic tilings using regular polygons, but extend it not uh, extend it to curved two-dimensional surfaces, so surfaces with positive curvature and negative curvature as well. Okay, so Escher, the person, okay, MC <laughs> stands for Moritz Cornelius. Okay, he was born in 1898, died in 1972 at the age of uh, 73. He was a Dutch graphic artist uh, who made woodcuts and lithographs, so he didn't do oil painting, he didn't do charcoal drawing. Woodcuts are basically, you know, you carve out an image on wood, you uh, put some ink on top of it, you roll a piece of paper <laughs> on top of that, and that produces a print, and you can produce multiple prints. A lithograph is actually an etching in stone. Okay, so those were the, the two main media that uh, Escher worked with. He was inspired by visits to the Alhambra in Granada, Spain in 1922 and 1936. And <coughs> based on those uh, visits from 1937 onward, uh, the topic of periodic tilings of the plane, which um, he basically saw when he was in Granada, uh, became his richest source uh, of, of inspiration. He was not a mathematician. He actually uh, failed high school math, I think, okay? Uh, but he thought like a mathematician. He was very systematic in what he did. Uh, and he corresponded with some mathematicians uh, over the years, with Paglia uh, Coxeter, who was a mathematician crystallographer, and Roger Penrose, whom I'm sure most of you uh, have heard of uh, in the context of relativity. Now, <coughs> Uh, expanding on that uh, connection, uh, back in 1954, there was an International Congress of Mathematicians in Amsterdam. And at the time, Escher wasn't a, uh, a, a famous artist, but he was giving a show nonetheless. And uh, several of the mathematicians went to the show. Two of the mathematicians were Roger Penrose and Roger Penrose's father, Lionel Penrose. Okay, And they were both uh, intrigued by uh, uh, Escher's artwork, in particular his uh, portrayal of impossible objects or impossible scenes. Okay? Now if you look at this closely, you'll see that this isn't an ordinary uh, scene here, right? If you look, <laughs> okay, there, are, there are the upright figures okay, in blue, there are left-leaning figures in red, okay? and right-leaning figures in green. And they're all walking up and down staircases, okay? This one, this uh, upright person walking down the staircase, uh, this uh, right-leaner walking down the bottom of the staircase, etc. okay? And if you draw lines, okay, uh, parallel, okay, to lines uh, that define the building, you'll see that those lines meet at vanishing points. And those vanishing points are either zenith points or horizon points or nadir points, depending on what type of person or figure you're, you're looking at, okay? So actually, in this context, gravity is acting in three perpendicular <laughs> directions, okay? 
this way for the upright uh, figures, this way down here for the left leaners, and this way over here for the right leaning figures. Yes, yes, yes. That's okay. So, uh, okay. So, so the, the the difference between dotted, solid, and uh, dashed is just to represent which sort of set of lines I'm talking about. Okay, that's that's it. Nadir means the point directly below. Zenith point means the point directly above, and horizon point means on the horizon. If you do any drawing, uh, sort of perspective drawing, you know that when you draw a cube, for example, in perspective, like this, the back of the cube is actually a little bit, the back face is a little, should be a little bit smaller than the front face. And if you extend those lines back, those lines should all meet at a so-called vanishing point, okay? So what I did is I just took lines in the figure, extended them back, okay? And if you look here, this green arrow is a nadir point for the right-leaning figures because it's the point directly below them, okay? That's right. Right, okay? That's why this is called relativity, okay? Okay? So anyway, oh, and I'm, I'm, I'm also particularly interested in these two, uh, people here because they're walking on the stair the same staircase but this one is going up the staircase and this one's going down the staircase okay okay anyway uh, the two Penroses after seeing the show thought that they would go back and create their own impossible objects okay so they wrote a paper th which was published in the British Journal of Psychology in 1958 okay yes go ahead how old was he? Um, I, I, I think he, w I don't know. Yes, 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 he was. No, I don't, thi I don't think he was that young. I don't know, we could look it up. Somebody could look it up now or whatever. <laughs> yeah, this is 1950. What? 27. Okay, yeah, okay, that's, that seems right. Okay. Okay, so anyway, so, so it was a paper written by Father Penrose and Roger Penrose. Uh, Father Penrose was a geneticist, a psychiatrist, a mathematician. He was a polymath, okay? This particular figure called a tri-bar is uh, Roger's invention. Uh, it's an object which is locally possible. All of these corners are, you know, make sense locally, but globally it's impossible, okay? Now, if you connect two of those tri bars together, you get this, okay? <laughs> okay? And if you follow along, you basically move along this horizontal path, but then you reach the top, which then brings you back down to the bottom, okay? So this is two interlocking tri bars. And guess who took advantage of that? Tri bar, well, Escher. So uh, the Penroses communicated with Escher, sent them uh, 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 the paper that they wrote, and Escher incorporated the double tri bar, oops, sorry, into this uh, print of his called Waterfall. Okay, so you can see the, the double tri bar here. Okay? That's right. So this is, this is a lithograph, so this is an etching in stone. Okay, so he's quite a, a technician, craftsman. Um, no, I, I think I think a woodcut a woodcut has a uh, has a uh, has a has a different look to it. Uh, this is a woodcut. Okay, so the colors are this isn't this is a lithograph. So if there's fine gradation of color, it's a lithograph. Okay, the other impossible object in the paper was this, okay, which was invented, if you will, by Lionel Penrose. It's a never-ending staircase, okay, and I liked it so much that I thought I would build my own, okay. So this is a photograph of my own never-ending staircase, okay, and you can do it yourself as well, okay. But <coughs> Escher incorporated that into this very famous uh, print of his called Ascending and Descending, 
And if you look, you'll see that there are, I mean, this looks like a monastery and there are monks walking around this never ending staircase, probably doing penance for some sins or something they committed, okay? <laughs> Except for two of the monks who don't want to take uh, uh, who don't want to partake uh, in that never-ending uh, cycle. Okay, so that was the connection to Roger Penrose that I wanted to make. So I want to move back to the more mathematical stuff. Uh, we'll talk about symmetry transformations. Okay, so here's a photo of the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. Okay, it was built originally in 889, uh, 889 as a fortress and then was converted uh, into a palace in 1333. Uh, it was built by the Moors. And it's known, um, it's most known for its uh, decorative wall tilings, which are in the background here, which you can't see because it's uh, a far away photograph. But here are uh, sort of three examples from something which is very simple, uh, black and white kite or uh, chevron shapes. Uh, which uh, are, you know, which repeat uh, both horizontally and vertically. Here is a slightly more complicated uh, wall tiling with uh, six-pointed stars. There are hexagons here, three-pointed propeller patterns, etc. And then this more complicated pattern has uh, six-pointed stars, eight-pointed stars. Here are twelve-pointed stars. There are hexagons. Etc. And this here is called the border pattern, sort of at the edge of the wall tiling. Um, I don't think we'll have time to talk about border patterns, but that's another interesting thing uh, to discuss. Okay. And here are some of Escher's sketches, which he made back in 1936, which was a second visit to the Alhambra. And the thing to take note here is the meticulousness of his drawings. Okay. They're actually done on graph paper. If you look hard, you can see the lines. Okay? Escher did everything carefully in a very systematic way. And I think by doing these types of drawings like this, he was trying to ingrain in his head uh, you know, the, uh, the techniques uh, that the Moors used in, in, in producing their wall tilings. Some observations. Okay? These Alhambra wall tilings are examples of what are called periodic tilings of the plain. So it's a complete covering of a flat two-dimensional surface like the wall or a floor using repeated congruent figures such that there are no gaps and no overlaps of the figures. Congruent means same size and shape. Okay? Now, instead of the geometric shapes which, uh, which the uh, Moors used because the Moors, uh, because Islam uh, forbidded, uh, forbidden the Moors from uh, representing humans or animals, <coughs> Escher wanted to use recognizable figures. So you'll see birds, fish, and lizards instead of hexagons, triangles, and squares, for example. Now the use of congruent figures, so same size and uh, same shape, basically limits the allowed transformations okay, to translations, rotations, reflections, and glide reflections. Now how many of you have heard of glide reflection? Okay, a handful of you. I guess it's actually in the high school math curriculum <laughs> nowadays, okay? But this was something that I never heard of until I started uh, sort of researching Escher, Escher and uh, these uh, periodic tilings. And just uh, as, as way of definition, to say that, some, uh, that something is symmetric with respect to a, a particular transformation, I will mean that it's unchanged after applying that transformation to it. It's, it's sort of mapped back to itself. Okay, so here's the first of Escher's prints that I want to show you. It has birds, black birds and white birds, okay? And we're going to ignore the color, okay? We're just going to pay attention to the, sh the shapes of the birds, okay? And this particular print has only translational symmetry. And the translation vectors are shown here by these uh, red arrows, okay? So if you take the, uh, the print and you slide it, from here to here, say, the print will go into itself, okay? It maps back onto itself, or if you translate it here to here, okay? So all of these periodic tilings have translation symmetry, okay? Here's a print that has translation symmetry, as all of them do, 
but it, there, it also has rotation symmetry, and the centers of the rotation symmetry are shown here. This is a six-fold, this, this center has six-fold rotational symmetry because if you rotate by 60 degrees, this wing maps to this wing, this wing maps to this wing, etc. Okay? This center here is a center of three-fold rotational symmetry, and this a center of two-fold rotational symmetry. Okay? Here's a print that has only translational and reflection symmetry or mirror symmetry. So mirror symmetry means that if you uh, reflect across this axis here, you get the same thing. Human beings, more or less, have reflection symmetry about an axis that passes through their center vertically like this. Okay, here's a little mock-up of, uh, you know, of the, the beetle, right? So you reflect it, you get the same, the same thing. Okay, so now let's go to the fourth uh, symmetry transformation, which is called glide reflection, okay? So I show here the translational vectors, okay? But it also has glide reflection. So glide reflection is a combination of first a reflection and then a translation, okay? So if you look here at, let's say, this dog here, okay? And you look at this axis here, okay? Then what you do is you first reflect and then you translate, okay? And it maps, so this dog maps to this dog under a reflection, then a translation, okay? And note that, the transla note that this translation up is not as long as that one. It's half as long, okay? So the, the amount of the translation is not the same as, as that. So it's an independent symmetry transformation, okay? Similarly, you can take the, do the dog, right, and you can consider an axis that passes through its sort of front jaw there, you reflect it and translate it and it maps back to itself. And then finally, you can do it through the, uh, the front legs here, provided, of course, you ignore color. Yes, Bruce? Yes. Uh, it might. I, I, I haven't given that much thought. Okay. But the, 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 the question that I've been asked in the past is, well, isn't a glide reflection just a combination of a translation and a reflection? Well, it does have a reflection, but the translation isn't one of these translations, right? Yes, you d that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what Bruce said is right. I don't know if it's a general result. Okay. Yeah, so this is a wood, this is... That's right. That's, that's right. So if you look at these, they, they could be very, very complicated. But, but, but that's, that's my understanding. Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay, now this final print, you can think of this as a, as a, test, as a test print, okay, which has translation, rotation, reflection, and glide reflection symmetry. Okay. So can somebody, so if we start here, where is, yeah, this is called angels and demons, okay? Where would the translation vector go from here to where? Right there, like that, okay? And then similarly over here, okay? So that's the translation symmetry. What about rotation? Do you see any, s okay? Well that's a, what, how many fold? Fourfold rotational symmetry. Any other rotational symmetry? The feet, the feet, twofold. Okay, so we got fourfold and twofold. Okay, what about reflection? Like that center of the angel and the center of the demon or the devil. Okay. Now, what about glide reflection? 
Yet you should think of glide reflection as like footprints in the sand, right, left, right, left, okay? Yes, yeah, so, so if, you, if you look here, right, if you reflect the angel here and then translate her up to here, okay, that's a glide reflection symmetry. Everybody see that? And similarly over here, reflect this way and slide her over. There's actually uh, another set of glide reflection axes, which is much harder to see. I see somebody doing the right yeah, diagonal. diagonal, okay? Now, to see that, okay, so let's look at this angel here. So you reflect and then translate, okay? So that maps that angel into that one. To go the other way, let's see, if you go like this, you reflect and translate up, that gives that, okay? So this is a, this is a more complicated print in that it has all four uh, all four uh, symmetry transformations, okay? Now, to give you an idea of Escher's thought process in creating these tilings, you can just think of uh, him starting with some sort of lattice, in this case, a, a checkerboard pattern of uh, rectangles, okay, or parallelograms. And then what he does for this particular uh, print is he deforms the... Uh, uh, deforms the rectangles or the parallelograms in such a way that the, the little bit that he takes out here, he puts over on the other side. And the little bit that he takes off here, he puts over here. The little bit that he takes off here, he puts over there. So he's preserving the area of the red and the white in this particular way. So he's translating a bit over here, translating a bit over here. And then he's just exaggerating that deformation in order to create something that eventually looks like birds, okay? So now you see that there are these red birds flying on a white background to the right. But then he said, well, let's just take the red birds and get rid of the internal detail, okay? And put some detail on the, the white background. And now you've got white birds flying on a red background to the right. Then over here, he does he puts detail in both, okay? So now you don't know what's figure and what's ground. And then over here, he said, well, let's just change the birds to be these sort of devious looking fish that are swimming to the left instead of birds swimming to the right. And then finally, he says, well, let's have the fish, the white fish go to the left and the birds <laughs> go to the right, okay? So this, I mean, I find this a very sort of clever uh, treatment of, uh, of the tiling. And, and, and if you look at Escher's prints, you can tell that he's sort of playing with you as you, uh, as you look at, at things. I don't, I don't think he had uh, people working for him, actually. Yeah, sure. My, my, well, yeah, people do do engravings on copper, but from what I've read about Escher, the lithographs were in stone, okay? Yeah, and these are the types of things that you can't make a mistake, right? Or you, <laughs> you chip off a piece of stone, you can't put it back, or not easily, okay? Now, <coughs> that sort of deformation where you take a little bit off and you put it over to the right and you take a little bit off over here and you push it up to the, uh, the top, that's not the only way that you can create these asymmetric tiles that would, would then subsequently tile the plane. You can start with different uh, lattices and you can also change uh, sort of the transformation that you do from one side to the other, okay? And if you look here, he's using a parallelogram lattice Okay, and this side here and this side here are related by a translation, right? So this little piece and this little piece are the same. But these two sides, there are rotations by 180 degrees, right? So if you rotate this here around this center by 180 degrees, this head maps to this one here, okay? Now, it turns out that there are 28 different ways of constructing such asymmetric tiles which you can then use to completely cover the plane without any gaps or overlaps, okay? And this was proven by this mathematician Heinrich Heech, Heech okay? And this uh, set of 
28 different sort of asymmetric tiles forms this thing called the Heche group, okay? Escher on his own came up with 27 of those, okay? Without, you know, without being a mathematician, okay? And interestingly enough, Heche was actually a mathematician who taught at the University of Hanover, okay, back in 1955, okay? So he ended up dying in Hanover uh, and he made this contribution to, uh, to mathematics. Okay, so now for the remainder of the talk, the, the, the last half an hour, I want to talk about <coughs> periodic tilings, not using these complicated asymmetric tiles, but using regular polygons, okay? And we'll first do it in the context of flat two-dimensional space, okay? So I'm gonna give you a quiz, okay, to begin with, okay? How many ways can you tile two-dimensional flat space, like the wall or the floor, using regular polygons? And remember, a regular polygon has equal length sides and equal interior angles, okay? So what are the, what are the number of ways? Okay. <laughs> yeah, people who don't know the answer. If it, yeah, so you're just using a single polygon, a regular polygon, something like a, like a square or an octagon or whatever. Okay. Okay, any answer? Or none of the above. <laughs> you got vote of three, okay. Anybody say something different than three? Infinity? No. <laughs> okay. Now the answer the answer is three, okay. Okay, and that's a tiling using equilateral triangles, squares or hexagons, okay, which you can see here, okay? So P here will represent the uh, number of sides of the polygon, so a P-sided polygon, meeting Q at a vertex. So you've got six uh, equilateral triangles meeting at each vertex here. Here you've got squares meeting four at a vertex, and here you've got hexagons meeting three at a vertex, okay? Now, the people who got this answer correct, how do you prove that these are the only three and that, you know, that there are three and no more than three, no less than three. Yes, what do you do? Okay, so that if you sum up the angles here, you need to get 360, which is correct, okay? So what you need is the sum of the angles around each vertex to equal 360. Now, what is this angle here? So if you have a P gone here, so if you got Q of these P-sided polygons meeting at a vertex, what is the interior angle of a P-sided polygon? Does anybody remember? Not 360 over P. P-sided. Okay. Does anybody know? Okay, so you know here it's 60, right? This is 90, this is 120. Okay. Well, the opening angle of a regular P-sided polygon is this, right? And you can see that by just taking the polygon and dividing it up into, into triangles, right? So this is a five-sided figure. You divide it up into three triangles, each of which have 180 degrees. Right, so it's P, <coughs> P minus two over 180, then divide by P, okay? So then all you need to do is take, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so I took my five-sided figure, so here P is equal to five. I could take a five-sided figure, divide it up into three triangles, each of which, as we know, has 180. P minus two times 180. But to get this angle here, I have to divide that total sum of angles, right, by P. So P minus two times 180 is the, is the sum of all of these angles, this plus this plus this plus this plus that. Okay, okay. 
So we have this, okay? So that's the opening angle of a regular pigon, okay? And we have Q of those, right? Meeting at a vertex. So we want Q times P minus 2 times 180 over P to be 360, okay? So this is the most complicated math we'll do. Not going to do quantum field theory, okay? <laughs> okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to divide by Q and divide by 180, okay? So that becomes 2, okay? And then this becomes 1 minus 2 over P, which becomes 1 half is equal to 1 over P plus 1 over Q, okay? So that's the condition, okay, that you need for a P-sided polygon meeting Q at a vertex to tile the plane. Question, yes? Why is this counted different than this? Because this is a different polygon than this. What about the square? Into what? Well, the triangles wouldn't be equilateral triangles. Okay. Right, but I mean, the question is, right, so, so the question is, can you tile the plane with hexagons? And the answer is yes, meeting three at a vertex. So even though, even though you can divide that up into, yeah. I mean, this, th the symmetries of this are, will be very similar to that, I believe. Well, you can rotate this by, by uh, 60 degrees, whereas you have to rotate that by 120. Well, no, no, no. We want to use regular polygons. Regular polygons yeah, means you need a P-sided figure that has equal length sides and equal interior angles, okay? But this is the condition here, okay? And it's quite a useful thing to remember if you haven't seen it before, okay? Um, oh, to shift it over here? Uh, you could do that. Um, right, you just shift it sort of like bricks. Okay. Well, I know. I, anyway, I I know that uh, that this and your shifted version have different sort of symmetry properties as far as you know, sort of wallpaper patterns if you think of it that way. But let's let for simplicity, so that I can sort of continue on. We'll just. <laughs> We'll just consider P-sided polygons meeting Q at a vertex, and then the condition is this, okay? And you can check now, right? So you need 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals a half. So what are the values of P and Q that give you that when you take 1 over P plus 1 over Q as a half? Well, you have 1 third plus 1 sixth is a half, 1 quarter plus 1 quarter is a half, and 1 sixth plus 1 third is a half. And you can't do it any other way with integers, okay? Now let's extend this to curved spaces, okay? And we'll extend it to a two-dimensional sphere, and we'll exp uh, extend it to two-dimensional hyperbolic space, which is a space with constant negative curvature. And we'll, we'll talk more about this space in just a bit, okay? So here are pictures of a flat space, a positively curved space like a sphere, and then a negatively curved space <coughs> Uh, like a saddle surface, okay? Now, these are different properties that each of those spaces have. The most relevant uh, piece of information for us is that if you sum the, uh, the interior angles of any triangle for a flat space, you get 180 degrees. For a positively curved space, you get something greater than 180. And for a negatively curved space, something less than 180. Things that everybody learned, I guess, in high school, okay? So now I ask the question, 
How many ways can you tile a two-dimensional sphere using regular polygons? Okay. Neil. Okay, well, no, I, I would like you to answer this question. You can answer it. Yeah, so you can so you can define a regular polygon. So on the curved space, the shortest lines are arcs of great circles, okay? So that would define a polygon, right? So you can you can define a polygon on a curved surface using geodesics, the shortest distance pass. So this is a curved polygon. This is a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a curved polygon, but but the <laughs> definition of polygon as equal length sides and equal interior angles still makes sense for a curved space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, right. So here's here's an example of a of an equilateral triangle, something that goes from the North Pole to the equator here, and then over ninety degrees. Okay. That's right. That's right. So eight of these, as Bruce said, would give you one such tiling. Okay? So we know that zero cannot be the answer. Oh, you've got an answer. Okay, what, what is it? Okay, so somebody says infinite. Infinite. Any objection to that? Yes. What do you say? You think zero? No, but here's 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 an example here. So we can't have zero because if you take eight of these here, that gives you. Yeah, yeah, but this is this is a polygon, right? The, uh, the, yeah, so this is this is a polygon, right, which is a three-sided polygon, equal length sides, equal angles here of 90 degrees. Okay, are we ready for the answer? Okay. There are two possibilities. <laughs> Five or infinity, okay. Okay. Now why is it why is it 5 or infinity? Okay. Well again, <coughs> you need to write down the proof that uh, to to prove this, you need to use the tiling condition for a two-dimensional sphere. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes. That's right. That's right. Exactly, yes. Okay, so Bruce is talking about a degenerate sort of case, if you will, because on the sphere you can have a two-sided polygon, right? In flat space, a two-sided polygon degenerates to a line, but on the sphere you can have something that looks like orange peels or, or like a beach ball, okay? And I'll show, th I'll show that in just, uh, just a second, so that's right, Bruce, okay? Now, the tiling condition is 1 over P plus 1 over Q is greater than a half, and that just comes from the uh, condition that now the opening angle is greater than uh, p minus two times one eighty over p. Okay, and if you take if you take that inequality through the calculation, you get this. Okay, so then <coughs> you can write down the values. You can check the values of p and q for which this is true. Okay, you have three three, four three, three four. 5, 3, and 3, 5, and then these degenerate cases, 2n and n2, okay? So this is the two-sided polygon, sort of the, 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 the uh, orange, orange peel type thing. Does anybody know what this looks like? It's an n-sided polygon meeting 2 at a vertex.
okay? Here it is. Okay, it's n-sided. <laughs> okay, so you just draw a circle around the equator, put n dots there, and there are two, <laughs> right? Okay, so I told you that th these were degenerate cases, okay? And this is the one that Bruce, Bruce came up with, okay? So here they are, okay? Uh, this is what we drew over here, right? Uh, Three-sided polygons meeting four at a vertex. Now, interestingly enough, okay, if you take those curves and you sort of pull them straight, you get a tetrahedron here, you get a cube there, you get an octahedron there, you get a dodecahedron there, and an icosahedron there. So the five different tilings that you, regular tilings that you can do on the sphere are really just the same as the five platonic solids, okay? Which I think is, is, is a cute result, okay? And here's, uh, here's Escher's rendition of angels and devils, but on a sphere, okay? Okay, and you can see here that he's using sort of the cube where you've got uh, quadrilateral, so, so squares, if you will, meeting three at each vertex, okay? Okay, so now let's go to two-dimensional hyperbolic space with constant negative curvature. Now there's a mathematical theorem that says that you cannot embed globally a two-dimensional space with constant negative curvature, okay, in, in ordinary three-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. So we're going to consider a representation called the Poincaré disk model, which I can show you how you get that uh, on, the, on the next slide. But it's basically a finite representation of the infinite space, which is this space with constant negative curvature, okay? And it turns out that straight lines in this space, or in this particular representation, uh, well, straight lines in the uh, constant negative curvature two-dimensional space are represented here by arcs of circles that intersect the boundary here at right angles the boundary representing infinity, okay? So the space with constant negative curvature is infinite in extent, but this particular representation called the Poincaré disk model represents it uh, as a finite disk, okay? Where infinity is represented here by the, the boundary of the disk and the straight lines in the space with constant negative curvature are in this representation given by arcs of circles that intersect here at right angles, okay? Yes, okay, yeah, so this is sort of a compactification of, of the space. Okay, now, because this is a space with negative curvature, the sum of the angles of a triangle is less than 180 degrees, so you can form a triangle using arcs of circles that intersect the boundary at right angles, because those are the, the shortest uh, distant paths, okay? This is a so-called conformal representation in the sense that angles are preserved from the original space into this representation, but it doesn't preserve distances, okay? So distances are actually distorted as you move from the center toward the boundary, okay? So although in the original two-dimensional hyperbolic space, all of these stick figures have the same size and are the same distance apart, as represented here, they get smaller, and the distance between them gets smaller as you move toward the boundary. And this is similar to what you have if you take a map of the globe of the Earth using stereographic projection where the, uh, the countries near the equator are sort of increased in size, okay? So there you get things bigger toward the boundary, whereas here for the, uh, the hyperbolic space, things appear smaller, okay? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, because 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 this is an example of a this is this is a degenerate case of a circle, okay, with with very large <laughs> infinite radius, okay. It intersects here. It has to intersect at, at right angles. So if you if you take this point and the point diametrically opposite, and you have the the, the line meet here, it has to be a straight line. Okay. Now, for those of you who are geometrically inclined, the way that you get this space is you consider two plus one dimensional Minkowski space time. So it's a, 
a, a space-time metric, so signature minus plus plus, and you take this unit space-like hyperboloid here, okay, and you project it to the unit disk here through the vertex of the hyperboloid, the unit hyperboloid on the other side with t equal to minus one, if you will, okay? And what's shown here is a, uh, a geodesic in the space, which you get by cutting the hyperboloid with a plane that passes through the origin, okay? And then you project points on this curve here through to this vertex, and then points on this curve here map to this, okay? So it's a nice little calculation to show that if you take this space here and you map it to the disk using this, uh, uh, this definition here, you get circles that intersect the boundary at right angles. Yes. Okay, so now I ask the question, okay, how many ways can you tile 2D hyperbolic space using regular polygons? Neil. D. D, infinity, correct. And why is that correct? That's right. It has to be less than uh, one half, which implies an infinite number of ways, okay, that you can do this. Okay, and here's a table showing different values of P and Q, okay, and the three different conditions, one over P plus one over Q being greater than, less than, or equal to a half. The flat space cases are shown here in red with F, okay, uh, three-sided polygon meeting set six set of vertex, et cetera. Uh, the uh, the non-degenerate two-sphere are in yellow, and then the degenerate cases for the two-dimensional sphere are in green, and then hyperbolic space in blue, and then just sort of continue on. Okay? Okay. Yes. I don't know. I haven't thought. So 3D where you where you use sort of volumes. So instead of polygons you use like cubes or whatever. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. And it turns out that there are 230 of those <laughs> as opposed to sort of 17 for the two-dimensional flat space case. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer would be for the, the sphere and the, uh, the hyperbolic space. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so here's, here's a tiling of the Poincaré disk or two-dimensional two hyperbolic space represented this way using 45, 45, 45 triangles, okay? So all of these triangles here, right, so, and they're meeting, what, eight at a vertex, okay? All of these triangles have the same size, the same shape, the same area, et cetera, although they look different, right, because as you move to the boundary, we have this distortion, as we said. And this is uh, sort of equivalent or analogous to what we have for the uh, flat two-dimensional case with equilateral triangles. Sure. Yes. It does. That's right, 45. Three times 360 over eight, three times 45. It should be three times 45, right, okay? Okay. Now we can push that, we can push that to the limit here, okay? Where we use triangles that have angles of zero, zero, and zero, <laughs> okay? So you extend the triangle to the boundary here. So the angles subtended are actually zero, zero, and zero, okay? Okay. And all of these triangles, again, have, all, have the same shape, et cetera, although they appear different. <laughs> okay, 
Now, <coughs> this is a print by Escher's called Circle Limit 1, okay, and it has these, these fish-shaped objects, uh, black and white, okay. And what he did is he built this on a scaffolding built, uh, uh, built from uh, a 6 4 tiling. So he's using hexagons meeting four at a vertex, okay. So this is Escher's uh, use of, uh, you know, tiling of uh, the Poincaré disk uh, to produce a piece of art, okay? Now, Escher got this idea from his mathematician crystallographer for friend Coxeter, who sent Escher uh, a mail, ordinary mail, <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> With a with a with a figure with a figure from a paper, okay, that that Coxeter wrote, where he had this, okay, and I didn't really read this, but uh, I mean it's a mathematical paper. There's Gauss and Lobachevsky, etc., and this figure was in the paper, and Escher was very pleased to get this because um, he was looking for ways to represent infinity, okay, in a finite region of space. And if you think of this, this is a way of representing infinity because you've got an infinite number of these triangles as you go toward the boundary. Now, Escher didn't know and probably didn't care about the underlying mathematics of Poincaré disk representations and hyperbolic two-dimensional space. But he was such a good draftsman that he was able to recreate the scaffolding sort of shown here using a compass <laughs> and straight edge, okay? So he didn't need the math, he could just sort of reproduce it in himself. Here's another circle limit print by Escher, uh, done in uh, 1959, uh, a year later. And it's a much nicer uh, print, uh, aesthet uh, aesthetically. The fish are organic instead of angular. They flow nicely from one boundary to the other. Okay, so Escher was quite proud of this. Uh, this is actually no. It's an 8-3 tiling, okay? So you've got octagons meeting three at a vertex, okay? So he used a different tiling for that. And then here's our friend again, uh, angels and demons or angels and devils, which is called heaven and hell here, circle limit four, okay? Which is now represented as a tiling of two-dimensional space with constant negative curvature, okay? And this is using the same 6-4 tiling that he used for circle limit one, okay? So here I bring all of those sort of three representations together, right? Angels and devils as a tiling of flat two-dimensional space, a tiling of the sphere, and as a tiling of two-dimensional hyperbolic space where these are the conditions here, okay? And Note that these centers of rotational symmetry, fourfold and twofold, become threefold here, uh, right? Threefold here. And this twofold becomes threefold here. And it has to do with the way that a sphere is curved around. So you, you need to sort of take out one of these angels here in order to curve the space around. Whereas for a hyperbolic space, it's the opposite way. You have to sort of put something in, okay? And that's, and that's shown here, okay? So I will end there with uh, some references. These are my favorite ones here uh, with stars. Uh, these are both written by mathematicians, Bruno Ernst and Doris Schnatschneider, okay? Uh, this is a sort of the definitive work on Escher's uh, periodic tilings, okay? And this is a great book uh, uh, to read as well. This was uh, done by Bruno Ernst, who's a mathematician who interviewed Escher the last two or three years of his life. Okay, so questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yep. No, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Yes, go ahead, Bruce. Okay.
Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> Other questions about, yes, yeah. <laughs> if you, I, I, you, you've probably heard of Roger Penrose's book, Road to Reality. Uh, you know, it's about this, this thick. Uh, I actually read it uh, or tried to read it. It took uh, several months. I started last summer in, in Hanover. And there's a very nice chapter. I can't remember if it's chapter two or three where this is talked about. Okay, so if you want to learn about this in a, sort of a somewhat more mathematical framework, uh, you can read Penrose's, uh, the relevant chapter from P Penrose's book. So, yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Yes. Uh, I think so, I mean, uh, it's, you need so so the the um, you need the tiling to repeat, okay, and you want it to repeat after some some sort of distance. So I th I, th I think I think you need a translation, and you can decompose the translation into two for the two dimensional space. So if you want to do that in three dimensions, you would have you know three vectors, three translation vectors as well. Yes, so just sliding. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Wait, wait, no. No, I think I. Well, let me s let me see here. Hold on. <laughs> oh, here it is. Sorry. Okay, so this is. You. OK, so I didn't talk about this, OK? But you can ask the question, how many different wallpaper patterns or tilings can you have of flat two-dimensional space? And it turns out that there are 17 different ways if you classify them according to their, their symmetry groups, OK? And I guess what you are talking about is, or somebody, is, is something like this, OK? Oh, well, then it's not a periodic tiling then. 
So, no, 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 no. I, no, I, we can, we can, we can go to the second slide or something like that. I think, I think I wrote periodic. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so, so this is periodic tiling. So, so one can, one can come up with a periodic tilings of the plane, and that's these Penrose tiles, for example. So they use a finite number of tiles, and you can uh, sort of tile the plane in such a way that you can't, right? So, 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 so it's not what homogeneous, right? You can't go. Excuse me. Yeah, here we're using yeah one tile. Yeah, that's yeah that's 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 fine. So, but what you're saying is you if you do it in an incommensurate way, such that you can never sort of find the same thing again, it's not it's not periodic. It doesn't repeat. Okay, so uh, so I guess it's definitely. Anyway, I just wanted to show that 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 these here have different uh, symmetry properties than, you know, but well, well, these have three different symmetry properties. And that that would be the requirement in order to get translation. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So so this is this is on the plane. You can ask the question in three dimensions, and th and that's where uh, sort of the crystallographic groups come in. And it turns out uh, that there are 230 different uh, sort of space, what is space groups uh, for that. I don't know. I, d I don't know very much about that. Excuse me. Yeah, for flat. Okay. And I know. I know. I've I've read that there are Penrose type tiles for three-dimensional space. So imagine, you know, constructing a lizard shape that you can sort of fit together, not just sort of in the plane, but sort of glue it on in, th in three dimensions as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, 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 I actually talked. Yeah, I, I, I talked to Roger Penrose about this back in I think 2013 uh, because Neil had mentioned this, and I said, oh, I heard from Neil Cornish that you have this three-dimensional object, which is impossible if you know, if you, if you, if you were in four dimensions. And uh, he said, yes, I have that. He said, um, but it never bothered anybody who came in my office except for the janitor who would clean his desk. <laughs> so <laughs> whether that janitor is a four dimensional. When you were in the office, <laughs> you know, the fourth dimension. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Okay. <laughs> Anything? Okay, well, I guess that's that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.